Welcome to Opalesque TV. Today we have Chris Aceto, CEO and founder of Gab Stowe Capital Partners, a $700 million asset under management credit specialist based out of New York. Chris, can you introduce yourself and tell us what your firm does on a day-to-day -day basis? Gapso Capital Partners is a $700 million multi-manager firm based here in New York. I'm the CEO and CIO, as you explained. I spend most of my time working on portfolios and evaluating investment ideas for, for each of our clients. As you mentioned, Gapso is a specialist in credit investing. Credit forms the central nucleus of all of our portfolios. On a day-to-day -day basis, the research team of which I'm a part are continually looking for new opportunities. That's how we view our role, to find from a top-down basis interesting areas in credit to be active in, structuring the ideas in vehicles that make sense, and finding and working with managers um, that can most effectively implement those. So how does Gapstow define credit? Credit is defined broadly at Gapso Capital Partners. Uh, many investors, particularly even alternative investors, historically have had a fairly narrow view of credit, almost synonymous between distressed corporate debt or maybe high yield. Those are perfectly legitimate and interesting and important asset classes. But with the founding of the firm, we thought it was interesting to begin thinking about credit in a much broader definition. For Gapstow, credit really is organized, our research and investment efforts organized around four primary areas. The first being corporate credit, but in addition to distressed debt, i.e. bonds, we're also very active in loans, in lending to companies, and in structured form of those instruments and other hybrid instruments like convertibles. Second area of focus is household debt or consumer debt. Where we spend most of our time there is in mortgages. That's the primary element of a, an individual's balance sheet, most typically. We're active in mortgages both on a securitized, securitized form, but also in whole loans. Thirdly, we're active in commercial real estate. Similar to residential, we're active in both whole loans and in securities formats, and in the whole loans with a particular emphasis on mid-market activities, small to mid-market activities. And then finally, bank investments. Banks are central to the credit creation process throughout an economy. We're active in the preferred and even some common equity holdings within banks. So how much should an investor have in credit? And what are the benefits of having credit in your portfolio? Typically speaking, they should have a lot more credit than they currently do have in their portfolio. It's, it's very interesting. If you go to even a sophisticated institutional investor and you ask them how much is invested in credit, um, the answer typically comes out to be less than 10% of their overall portfolio. Now, as a, a quick pause, let's differentiate, and we help investors think about it this way, differentiate fixed income from credit. Fixed income we define as things that you're invested in where you don't have the risk of principal or payments not coming back to you, at least in nominal or, or, or uh, uh, notional form. Credit is where you do take some of that risk, either on the principal component or the timing and amount of payments that are associated with that. With that definition, and even using the broader four sub-buckets that we talked about before, again, even for a sophisticated uh, portfolio, you quite often find that that number is less than 10%. Now, if you accept the proposition that credit can produce reasonably attractive returns, both in an absolute as well as risk-adjusted uh, uh, performance, and I think the last three to four years have shown that to a great extent, coupled with the at least empirical fact to date that correlations with equities are modest, that credit, in fact, as we define it, gives you exposure to risk factors that are not simply equity beta beneath it all, good returns plus some diversification probably at least motivates the idea that it should be greater than 7% in somebody's portfolios. So again, the prop debatable, ultimately there it is, but it's not un inconceivable to see somebody who would have a 20 or 25% standing allocation to credit. And in fact, Gapstow was built around the, the assertion that we would like to be active participants in helping institutions build that allocation to a much more substantial component of their portfolio.
So how are investors viewing risk in credit strategies? What kind of questions do they ask you when they're considering investing with you? It's a bit of an education process because they are risk factors to which people are not necessarily uh, that experienced. First take relative to fixed income. Now we know fixed income isn't riskless. There is duration, interest rate risk to holding bonds, even of the highest quality. There is currency risk if you're holding something from outside the U.S. in our case. But we define by fixed income to be those things where you don't feel you're in jeopardy of losing your principal, on a nominal basis at least, and the coupons associated with it. By definition, credit ads to some of the more traditional bond risks, the potential for loss to both principal and the coupons, or at least the timing and magnitude of the coupons associated with that, reflecting some underlying borrower's credit worthiness. Those are different risk factors that people need to accept and learn about. And the degree that they are, so to speak, risky varies a little bit by security. Obviously, we know how to credit score people. People with higher credit scores, you take less risk to that, that repayment versus people who do not. And so is that riskier than equities? Depends a little bit on that degree of credit risk that you're taking. But again, I'll emphasize that it's different than equity risk. And that's the point to being interested in credit, that there are degrees of risk along a continuum, but it's different than fundamental equity beta. One question we get all the time is on valuation in credit funds and how you value the underlying assets in your fund. Can you give us some insight here? It's a very important issue when working extensively in credit because unlike public equities especially, many aspects of credit are not traded in fully transparent liquid markets. OTC, buy BWIC, other processes that don't quite meet level one definition certainly by accounting standards. And so one needs to think very carefully about the policies of, uh, in our case as a multi-manager, two levels, both the underlying manager that we work with and our valuation processes internally. With the underlying manager, we want to make sure that between the manager, their hopefully independent administrator and auditor are all well adept at valuation practices and access to data to appropriately put marks on uh, the portfolios that they're managing for us. Internally, we like to invite investors in to kick the tires on what we do. First of all, it begins with having our own independent administrator who receives marks independently of our firm, um, but also internally when it does come up to issues that we deal with internally, we have a very strong internal valuation policy as well. Now, that said, you still have to deal with the practicalities of working in an area where potentially there are some not fully transparent prices. When we have found one possible or potential mitigant to that situation is by changing the structure of the fund. And to, to give you an example, um, if one is concerned about even despite best efforts, the quality of some of the marks associated with securities, we often then think about can we align everyone's interests by creating a back-ended incentive scheme by which managers who are working with us are paid on realized profits as opposed to simply the marks that we take on an unrealized basis along the way. You know, that sale price is unambiguous. We receive dollars in for the security that was sold. Along the way, it might be a little curious. We'll do the best efforts, but to make sure that the manager has the full incentive and we're not disincentive uh, along the way to, to mark things appropriately. If they take their carry at the end, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, the, uh, the ultimate mark to the security. Within your credit strategies, where are you seeing opportunities? Let me tell you about three areas that we're very active in from a research standpoint. Within household credit, uh, we are uh, still very active as we've been for the last four years in residential mortgage securities. The, the thesis simply is one that says that over the last six to 12 months, we have actually seen indications that the U.S. residential housing market is not just simply not getting worse, but actually improving on many, many dimensions from home price appreciation through the number of remaining distressed properties through the backlog of unsold inventory overall. 
And we are working to not only continue to take exposure there, but also find subcomponents of MBS that are potentially that much more exposed to an upturn in housing, those that are potentially taking collateral exposure that is a little bit more, so to speak, macro GDP intensive as housing rebounds, those will benefit disproportionately. Those include some of the subsectors of borrowers that were less credit worthy at the beginning, but are pools that, again, have been discounted to a much heavier extent and may therefore see, uh, see disproportionate increases as uh, housing rebounds much further. Within the credit sector, corporate sector, we, uh, we're, we're very active in loans, and we think syndicated loans right now uh, present a very interesting opportunity on a relative yield basis. We also are constructive on the ability to enhance those yields through CLOs, and you're probably familiar with the fact that CLO issuance, new issuance, has become quite active and we think that's clearly in response to what is that fundamental arbitrage between yields that are achievable plus the funding costs. And we are uh, actively working there um, to participate in new primary issuance. Um, within banks, uh, we're very interested in community banks. As you may know, the U.S. is a very interesting banking system. We have 7,000 odd banks, not branches, but actual banks across the country. Um, they serve a very important purpose. In addition to taking local deposits from individuals, they really serve to support the small and mid-sized businesses within their communities. We believe that the United States is continuing to recover from a broad economic standpoint, and, and certainly targeted areas within the U.S. Are, are doing quite well. We believe community banks should therefore be a very good barometer of that improved activity. And this is not necessarily a case where all community banks are going to do well, but we still believe that select community banks within the broader universe stand to benefit disproportionately from the rebound in lending and economic activity that are happening in their local communities. Some investors say that credit had a great run, but that spreads have compressed so tight that uh, that great run is over and that there's no longer opportunity in the credit space. How would you address that idea? Yeah, we, we get that in, in meetings quite often. And what I think people mean by that is that, that rates and spreads are so tight relative to, let's call it, four years ago. I mean, that is a, that is a true statement. And, uh, and when people look at where those marks are on an historical basis, how much more can they grind tighter and therefore you know, there can only be downside from here. That usually reflects a very narrow definition of credit, which is perhaps high yield. Well, yes, if you're working in fixed income securities, there's no question that the bond math works, that if spreads expand, you are exposed to that in a negative manner. But again, let's get back to our broader definition of credit. Um, not everything is a fixed coupon. In fact, if you looked at our flagship portfolio right now, which reflects many of the work that we do in all of the areas of credit within, within GAPSTOW, it's interesting to note that right now we have virtually no interest rate exposure. That's a broad statement. It, let me back it up by saying across all the collateral classes, we are now largely working in floating rate format. Again, in our corporate credit exposure, we're taking that exposure either directly through loans or in CLOs. Perhaps a modest amount of impact by a shift in LIBOR, given LIBOR floors in the structure, but generally stated, the exposure to a rising rate is mitigated to a degree surprising to someone who is used simply to rising rates is bad for fixed income. Many of the mortgage securities that we invest in are those which, as an under, the underlying basis, is a loan which is made in floating rate format, um, especially uh, not only some of the core direct loan-only holdings, but also in many of the mortgage derivatives as well. And there are other aspects of the, the, uh, the investing portfolio. For example, some of the bank holdings, preferreds, who actually benefit, as banks benefit from, generally speaking, a rising rate environment, that they should benefit as well. 
one of the interesting things we do like to point out to people is while it's not always true, you can create a diversified credit portfolio right now that does not have a significant exposure uh, to rates, both positively and negative, could grind tighter from here. And we're not macroeconomists within Gapstow. Uh, we don't have a forecast of rates, but we do recognize fundamentally that rates are pretty tight right now, and all things equal over the last 12 to 18 months, when we can find equally attractive return opportunities in floating rate format, we have tended to gravitate to them.